The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine. An Indigenous filmmaker uses her work to fight injustice. People gather downtown to reduce poverty in BC. And firefighters extinguish children's hunger. Hello and welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Steve Zhang. And I'm Frances Lee. Following the recent provincial budget announcement, outraged BC residents took to the streets to protest the lack of an anti-poverty plan. Aziz Hajiri has more. Every single province in this country has a poverty reduction plan except BC. Hundreds of people gathered in front of the Vancouver Public Library to speak out against the increase of poverty in BC and to denounce what they see as a lack of action from the provincial government. Christy Clark has got to be gotten rid of. She can't be Premier anymore. The budget that was just recently released completely ignored welfare rates. Um, the increase to persons with disability rates were embarrassing. I would not vote uh, for a party that doesn't, su doesn't support the plan. The rally was held in reaction to the recent budget that they believe does not provide enough solutions for people living in poverty. They are asking for a comprehensive poverty reduction strategy that includes increasing welfare rates, cheaper daycare, and a $15 minimum wage. I earn $600 every month illegally, paid in cash, beginning. under the table. Because, you don't have any because I can't live! More than half a million British Columbians live in poverty, according to the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition. Many of them are here demanding a change in leadership. John Horgan has actually uh, said that he would implement the 10-a-day plan if elected. For me, personally, I'll be voting for the NDP. I will uh, be voting for the NDP. NDP leader John Horgan was in attendance to show support, but also to point out what he says is the government's inaction when it comes to reducing poverty. The BC Liberals seem to ignore and neglect people. Instead, they focused on the wealthy and the well-connected. Tax breaks for the rich do nothing for people in poverty. The provincial government has yet to comment on their strategy to fight poverty. Attendees say they will vote for the candidate that will commit to a strong poverty reduction plan and hope the issue won't go unnoticed next time. Aziz Hajari in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. We are now joined with Aziz. Aziz, do you think the attendees will vote for the NDP in the following provincial election? Well, many of the people I spoke to will vote John Horgan in May. Uh, the NDP has been supporting the implementation of a poverty reduction plan for years. John Horgan himself said they brought forward a plan that was rejected six times. Uh, however, not everyone will vote NDP. Uh, some said they hope the Liberals will have a poverty reduction strategy by the time of the election. So it seems like whomever will have the best plan would get their vote. Back to you. The Public Health Agency of Canada issued another warning about an outbreak of norovirus in BC oysters. The agency says 22 more illnesses have been reported, bringing the total number of cases to 289. The cause of the outbreak is under investigation. Vancouver firefighters are helping to feed vulnerable kids during spring break. My co-anchor Francis Lee has the story. This might look like a lot of food, but for some, it's just not enough. We're in a very tricky and difficult time in our city's life where a new bar opened downtown at the Trump Tower where you can buy a bottle of gin for $450. There's people who can afford that, but there are working families within a few blocks of here who can't put enough on the table to make sure their kids are getting a full meal. The Vancouver Firefighters Charities started snacks for kids to help these families. 
there are two major gaps in the school program. Uh, there's Christmas and spring break. Uh, Christmas, there's a bunch of uh, uh, additional support programs that exist during that period. Spring break being two weeks, there's not as much support uh, during that time period. This is the first year that VFC is extending this initiative for kids during spring break. Trying to bridge the gap with this new program and sending uh, food free food resources home with the kids. Foods such as apples, juice boxes, pastas and soups. 350 bags filled for every meal for all participating schools. Mulcahy, along with others, are hoping this such program continues for upcoming years. We don't have a poverty reduction plan in BC. If we had such a plan, I think we'd see the numbers go down and hopefully this program wouldn't be necessary. But until that strategy comes, Snacks for Kids will continue making packages for those in need. Francis Lee in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. A filmmaker is telling the unheard stories of Aboriginal people. And as my co-anchor Steve Zhang reports, she's also using her work to fight against injustice. Everything's happening to us. We don't have any agency. We don't have any say in it. Lisa Jackson is an Anishinaabe filmmaker whose body of work includes many short films. She recently screened two of her films at the Van City Theatre as part of Real Canada's Beyond 150 Years, a celebration of Indigenous films and their creators. Don't one of the shorts she screened was Savage, a musical piece about a mother separated from her daughter who is taken to a residential school. Jackson says it's liberating to make these projects in an indigenous film community where the filmmakers support each other rather than compete. I think that it's, uh, it's one of those things we could sort of rail at, oh, these are the things we don't like about the system, uh, and maybe we do that to some degree, but there's also the fact that we're just showing a different way of doing it by the work that we're doing. The goal of this was to challenge each other as creators. While her films show just some of the suffering endured by Indigenous people, Jackson says there isn't one story she wants to tell. I'm always pushing for um, against injustice and for the underdog, for the people who fall through the cracks, and that's something I feel really committed to. Real Canada Executive Director Jack Bloom says there have been many Indigenous stories told in the past, but they were never told by Indigenous people. He hopes the people at the screenings take away a new perspective on the issues facing First Nations communities. This is one of the best and most accessible ways to enter into this world, encounter their experience, see what we've been missing, and hopefully find some way of healing some of the, the negative experiences that have happened in our country's history. We see a certain slice of truth or reality through the media. Jackson says her films are her way of flipping the script and fighting against the skewed portrayal of Indigenous stories in mainstream media. She hopes to tell a different side of the story that often goes unheard. Steve Zhang in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Next on BCIT Magazine. A BCIT instructor helps her students break down traditional gender roles. Vinyl records are finding a modern resurgence. And the Electra Women's Choir is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Everything is changing to digital. Everything is online. People aren't just waiting for the 6 o'clock news anymore. People want their news right now. They want to be able to go onto their smartphone, onto the internet, and see the news that they want to see. Vancouver is growing at you know, a really rapid rate, the Lower Mainland even, and with the tools that we're given here, we're able to cover all of that. Welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Radhika Sika King. In the program, they really leave it up to you. I mean, the help is there when you need it, figuring out how to use the programs like Premiere, Audition, and figuring out how to use the cameras. But it's up to you to sort of experiment and figure out what you can do when you go out in the field. They brought candles and flowers to remember the student who lost her life yesterday. Theresa May says the international community condemns Moscow. They really make sure that you know the basics and you are able to put out a quality product. I'm Brady Tretinero. And I'm Radhika Sigi King. Thank you for tuning in to BCIT Magazine. Welcome back to BCIT Magazine. With Women's Week in full swing, our reporter Tristan Martin Woodhouse examines how many young women are defying traditional gender roles here at BCIT. He brings us this report. Seeing projects like these on display at BCIT's Burnaby campus isn't uncommon. But what makes many of these projects special isn't what they're made of, it's who they were made by. 
BCIT is finding that traditionally male-dominated fields like woodworking and engineering are now the vocation of choice for more women than ever. Tamara Pongrass was one of those women back when she decided to go into plumbing. She now helps other women find their places in trades. There are so many opportunities that employers and industries are having to really take a good hard look at uh, Canada's population and considering that women are half or more than half of Canada's population, they are having to look a little more closely at uh, providing opportunities for women to be welcomed into their workplace. And BCIT students like Katie Mellon find they're being welcomed not for their similarities to male counterparts, but for their differences. Women have a very different kind of value sometimes to offer the workplace. For instance, like I, I'm pretty sure anybody you will talk to will say, like, you know, we, we love hiring women because they're they're very detail oriented they're very good at planning out projects, they're very good at finishing work, they're really excellent for that kind of stuff. I only really feel like the workplace can be made better by the addition of those things. And as women like Pongrass continue to make a career in trades a more attractive prospect for people of all demographics, they hope increasingly diverse classes will lead to equally diverse workplaces. Tristan Martin Woodhouse in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Tristan Martin Woodhouse is joining us now. Tristan, does it seem like more women are choosing to enter the trades after high school? Yeah, well, it would seem that it has. Now, I don't have any concrete numbers for you, but based on anecdotal evidence that I received, it seems like more women than ever are getting into trades. I spoke to one instructor from the Technology Teacher Education Program who says five out of 22 of his students right now are women, which is the highest number he's had in the last five years. Uh, and now that was a sentiment that was also expressed by Pongrass when I spoke to her. So more women are entering the trades. Did you get an inkling of why that is? Well, many of the women I spoke to said they didn't go into trades because they were trying to make a political statement or anything like that. They just wanted to go where the jobs are. Uh, we're living in a province right now where there is a huge demand for skilled tradespeople, and so many women feel like they can make a better living going into traditionally male-dominated fields, and if they happen to break down gender roles while they're at it, that's just an added bonus. Back to you. In an age where books, movies, and music can be streamed online, vinyl records are making a surprising resurgence. Our reporter Eric Dakowitz explored this growing trend. To some, nothing quite beats the warm sound of a vinyl record. Over the last five years, they've made a comeback with Canadians buying over half a million records in 2016 alone. Ben Frith, the manager of Vancouver's oldest record store, says vinyl is still popular because nothing's beat its quality. Vinyl hasn't been replaced by something better yet. Uh, it's, uh, it's yet to be seen. You know, uh, the thing with CDs is, you know, you can perfectly replicate the audio of a CD on your computer. Uh, you know, with digital files, you can rip it, download it. Uh, vinyl, you still can't re recreate that experience. Radio stations used to rely on vinyl for playing music before CDs and digital databases, including here at BCIT. We used to, so how it works now is everything we use for music is digital. So we, queue, we can queue up songs on the computer and stuff like that. However wasn't so easy before you had to actually use like like a turntable like this and queue up the song and get it like you do a quarter turn half turn get it so it's right at the song the school used to have a large back catalog of vinyl but the newfound popularity has shrunk the supply so we had like huge piles of huge piles of records and recently actually we just brought them out of storage and let everyone kind of go wild on them and take as many as they wanted and now I think we're left with a, maybe a hundred left but yeah there was a lot more. Frith says the sense of ownership is part of what makes collecting vinyl records so special. Pulling the big the big piece of artwork you know you've actually paid for something and you receive it where you know a lot of people have uh, trouble coming to grips with the fact that you spend money on a digital file that you're never going to hold. With digital streaming so readily available, vinyl records show that people still want something to hold on to. Eric Dakwitz, in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. To celebrate International Women's Day, we now go to Kylie Edwards, who's taking a look at some of the most influential women in Canadian history. That's right, Steve. Women have played a very important role in Canadian history. Let's start at the beginning. In the 1600s, the French government sent over more than 850 single women to help build Canada's population. They were known as the King's Daughters and were from mainly poor areas in Paris. They were a very important part in building family life. 
Next up is Mary Shad Carey. She was the very first black female newspaper publisher in Canada. She built a racially integrated school in Windsor, Ontario and recruited African American soldiers for the American Civil War. Next is Therese Cascane. She was the first female political leader in Canada. She played a huge role in the women's suffrage movement in the 20s and before that she hosted a program for MENA on Radio Canada. She went on to be the leader of the CCF which eventually turned into the NDP. And lastly is Kim Campbell. Kim Campbell was the first and only female Prime Minister. The UBC grad served as our nation's leader in 1993 for six months before the Conservative Party lost the election. Those were just a few of the most important women in Canada's history. Back to you. The Electra Women's Choir celebrated its 30th anniversary on International Women's Day. We took a look at how co-founder Morna Edmondson helped create this historic institution. We rounded up some singers we knew and we rounded up some music and uh, we, we never thought it would be going 30 years later. It's amazing. I hope that a lot fewer girls have gone in the bathroom and cried because their name was on the wrong list over all these years. I think it has really changed. And a hundred years ago, the women's choir music would have been all about flowers or whatever. You know, it would have kind of been... Um, fairly feminine and um, a bit sort of monochromatic, I guess. And uh, so now we can sing about anything and we can sing with great force and power and beauty. We are singing with an amazing soprano soloist named Isabel Bayraktarian. She's Canadian of Armenian descent. So we're singing, the program started with uh, a suite of hymns that she had arranged, her husband actually arranged them for her and a women's choir. I think if a choir gets off on the wrong foot with a new piece, they feel anxious about it. You know, they're, they're all incredibly smart people. We have people that could, you know, run the country in the choir but they're not necessarily professional singers. They have a lot of training. They passed an audition to get into the choir, which includes reading, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that they're the best reader in the choir. So I want them to open that score and not be afraid that I've given them something they're not up to. So I need to find a way to make sure that we touch on things that they feel, oh, oh, yeah, okay, we can do this. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, the youngest entrepreneur in BCIT history. And a local basketball team enters foreign territory. The most rewarding thing for me has been the relationships I developed in the program, both with instructors and classmates. My sense of confidence has never, never been higher. I mean, this, this program has offered great opportunities to be in real world, real industry situations, and, and being in those moments and knowing I can contribute, I can do this. It's exciting to be in this industry and to meet lots of great people and to make amazing friends. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, realizing your potential. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Uh, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. Check it out from Tuesday to Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at 2117 Granville Street. Oh, one second. Oh, I'm getting a call from Quinn. One sec. Kylie, what are you doing this weekend? Okay, well, ditch Sam and come with me to the HBC World Rugby 7 Series at BC Place. 16 teams will compete for the championship, including Canada and the U.S., and we can still get tickets online at Ticketmaster.ca. You in? Kylie? She hung up on me. Hey, Sam. No, sorry, Quinn wanted me to ditch you, but no chance. I have an idea, though. 
After the painting exhibit, we can go check out the Vancouver International Dance Festival. They're showcasing the diversity of contemporary dance until the end of March. The performances, workshops and dance activities will be held at various venues throughout Vancouver. And for tickets, you can go get them at vidf.ca. Can you go get us some? Welcome back to BCIT Magazine. The Vancouver Taxi Association plans to fight the arrival of ride hailing in BC any way possible saying the B.C. Liberals plan to introduce Uber and other services by December doesn't take into consideration the interests of taxi companies. The high school provincial basketball tournament is taking place this weekend. Our reporter Nathan Hutton caught up with one of the underdog teams involved. It's been 10 years since the Pine Trees boys basketball team was warming up the day before the provincial tournament. Their co-captains, grade 12 Imran Hutta and grade 11 Hamid Hawadi, have brought the T-Wolves back after many years of irrelevance in the BC high school basketball circuit. I think all the guys are pretty excited about it because we're kind of like the underdogs. And uh, we've, worked, we've worked really hard to get here. And yeah, we're really proud of it and hopefully we can make a good run in provincials. The T-Wolves' only previous berth into the BC tournament came over 10 years ago when the team was led by now coach Luke Ireland. It's been quite the turnaround for Pine Tree, who just two years ago finished the season without a win. According to Coach Ireland, it's been all about the commitment of the players. I know that this year, you know, uh, playing with the guys in the summer, practicing in the fall, um, just, you know, having guys that are committed that want to come out and do their best and give their best, and having 15 guys that, one through 15, all want to contribute to the team's success, that's been a huge difference. One of the biggest changes for teams coming to the virtual tournament is playing in the over 5,000 seat stadium. Captain Imran Hutta says that won't be a problem, even though it does feel like they're celebrities. I mean, it's the biggest stage in BC, so we're pretty excited about that. We kind of feel like celebrities around here, so I don't know, it's a big jump from our gym back in Coquitlam to here. Regardless of their finish at the tournament, it's been quite the year for the little known big school out of Coquitlam. Nathan Hutton in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. You may have heard of Dragon's Den. It's a chance for people to pitch their business ideas. Well, BCIT has their own version, Lion's Lair. Matt Humphrey has the story of one pint-sized pitcher. Go on, go on, shake all their hands, okay, babe? Okay? 11-year-old Ella Candy is about to enter the Lion's Lair. <laughs> Be confident, babe, okay? I feel like you're going to cry. That's okay. She's the youngest pitcher they've ever had. The highly anticipated competition, hosted by the group Enactus, lets young business people get feedback on their ideas. It's obvious to me that money can't buy happiness. Everyone is excited for Candy's pitch. I think back what I was doing at 11 years old. Um, for her to have her own business at 11 years old is incredible. Um, and I'm you know, happy to be a part of her journey and to watch her business grow. Okay, I have handouts, so I'm going to keep Candy's been working on her pitch for weeks, and now it's her turn to play before Board of Professionals. I'm currently sort of like a kid's Etsy called, called Cause We Trade. Cause We Trade will be an online marketplace and safe community for kids to sell their own handmade items and to interact with one another. So you to ask a question, share an idea, or to just be inspired. But there's a catch. To be able to sell on the website, you have to be donating some of your proceeds to a charity. 5 to 15% will go to your charity based on your level of giving, and then the rest will go to the vendor. This and a membership and a mentorship program will help Cozy Trade feel more like a community, one that kids want to be involved in. Now, this may not seem too exciting, but when we increase our... <laughs> her mother, Monica Candy, has been with her daughter every step of the way. Grade six, seven students in the province, then our revenues will increase to nearly $130,000. Now that's exciting. At the end, mother and daughter fielded questions from the experts. Candy says Enactus, through tutoring sessions, helped her improve her public speaking skills. When I when I sell something on my original business and when I get to donate the money to the charity. It makes me feel really good and happy. And so I wanted to share this feeling with other kids. <laughs> After all the presentations, Candy was awarded second place out of dozens of pitches. 
Matt Humphrey in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Wow, 11 years old. You know, I, I wish I was as ambitious as Ella was when I was her age. Yeah, right? When I was her age, I remember jumping on my mom's trampoline, actually. Yeah, I was still riding my bike around the block, you yeah. know? Having fun. <laughs> Good times. Good times. <laughs> if you have any questions regarding the show, you can contact us at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. That was your BCIT Magazine. I'm Steve Zhang. And I'm Frances Lee. Thanks for watching. We now take another look at the Electro Women's Choir.